Welcome to A Place of Hope in Forney, Texas, where you will find hope-filled, obedient, passionate, and engaging people. Now on to today's message with Dr. Kevin Wentworth. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody, to A Place of Hope. This is a, a group of folks that are hope-filled, obedient, passionate, engaging followers of Christ. And we are here to, uh, to bring hope to a hurting world. And that's kind, of our, that's kind of been our thoughts over the course of these years. And this is our first Sunday night, Sunday, Sunday night, Sunday, Sunday night, Sunday night. I'm really speaking well. That's what happens when you preach in the morning and have to do it again at night. But uh, Sunday night a time, and we appreciate you coming out. Next Sunday, Norita will be sharing the word. And uh, I know that you'll enjoy yeah, Susie clapped for Norita, but she didn't clap when I said I was preaching. But anyway, that's a, anyway, uh, she'll be preaching next week, and I know you'll enjoy her. We're going to go to Detroit and visit our kids and go to that gorgeous, wonderful state of Michigan for all you Ohio State Buckeye folks. But tonight, we are glad you're here, and uh, we're going to share the word, but we're going to sing some song. This one's probably new to you. It's relatively new to me, but uh, the next ones you'll, you'll know pretty well. But we just want to praise the Lord tonight with worship. And Marty, why don't you lead us out in prayer, will you? Just lead us in prayer tonight, will you, please? Our God and firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken, we trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. We are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom. Unmatched in all your wisdom. In love and justice you will reign. And every knee will bow. We bring our expectations. Our hope is anchored in your name. Amen. The name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. 
You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Or are you more? You are victorious. We lift our banners high. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has, sing it again. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Amen. He is the king forever. Let's stand together and you'll know this one. I'll get you one you know. But it's new songs we like to kind of pick up on and figure out some new ones that uh, have a great message behind it. But that song talked about hope, and we have a hope. That's why this place is called A Place of Hope, is because we have hope in what Christ wants to do in our lives. And our hope should be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust a sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Sing it now. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope. And sing it now. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, 
All other ground is sinking sand. I heard you on that one, so I know you know that one real well. And we praise the Lord for his hope. And we also have to realize as we've come to Jesus, and I'll let you stand for one more, and then I'll let you sit down for the last one. This has become a, a pretty awesome song in my own heart and repertoire of singing. And it speaks a lot about Jesus and his beautiful feet. How beautiful the hands that served The wine and the bread and the sons of the earth How beautiful the feet that walked The long dusty road and the hill to the cross how beautiful how beautiful how beautiful is a body of Christ. How beautiful the heart that bled, that took all my sin and bore it instead. How beautiful the tender eyes that chose to, amen, forgive and never despise. How beautiful, how beautiful. the body of Christ and as he laid down his life we offer this sacrifice that we will live just as he died think about this willing to pay the price willing to pay the price how beautiful how beautiful The body of Christ. How beautiful the feet that bring the sound of good news. Amen. And the love of the King. How beautiful. The hands that serve the bread and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful. the body of Christ. No need to go to that last verse we just sang. How beautiful the feet that bring the sound of good news. Let's sing it again. How beautiful 
the feet that bring the sound of good news amen and the love of the king how beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth how beautiful amen how beautiful how beautiful is a body of God's people said, how beautiful his feet. You may be seated. And we know that if those beautiful feet and those life, and when I think about the body of Christ tonight, we are the body of Christ. How beautiful it is to be a part of the body of Christ when we do what he's asked us to do, when we're called to be what he's asked us to be. And the one thing that's so vitally important to this walk is understanding we need him. We can't do what we do without him. We can't be what we need to be without him. And even though we're thankful for his life and his death, I'm grateful for his life that lives in me now through his Holy Spirit. We're gonna talk about that tonight. But this is a great song. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here. I find my rest and without you I'd fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you where sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found amen praise the lord is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me and where you my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you singing now. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. My one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. And all God's people said, I need him tonight. Amen. Thank you, Marty. For those of you that may not know, Marty is our pastor that uh, helps us with our celebrate, not, not really celebrate recovery. We call this a place of hope, but also a place of recovery. And Marty helps us. And we've been having some good times on Friday night. We've been trying to get this off the ground. And so we're grateful for Marty and driving from Midlothian and uh, sharing with us. And Two of our ladies that are a part of our church, too. We're glad to see you. And my friends, my friends from a, from a long time ago, but they're still our friends because we get a chance to have fellowship with them. I might, did my mic trans over, transfer over there, Norita? I think maybe. But uh, we are glad to have you all here tonight. Good to have you. Good to have you on this Sunday night. And so I'm grateful for his presence and grateful for the opportunity. And I, I, as I preached a couple weeks ago, the thing that's so interesting and intriguing to me is I am so, I get so excited when I think of Pentecost Sunday because of the Holy Spirit. I, I just think we don't really give the Holy Spirit enough attention. We talk about him. We talk about believing in the Holy Spirit, but I've always liked Pentecost Sunday. I told you before that I found out that there's not a Hallmark card day on Pentecost Sunday. You just don't send happy Pentecost to you or anything like that. It's not a Hallmark holiday. And my wife and I, ever so often, uh, we watch the Hallmark channel. I haven't seen a Hallmark movie that says anything about Pentecost. Although, I have to tell you, every time I watch Hallmark channel, I always cry at the end, even though I already know what the ending's going to be. Boy finds girl, girl finds boy. They get upset with each other, they go separate, and at the end, they run to the airport after each other. They don't, have a, they don't have a Holy Spirit one, though. I don't, that don't make sense to me. But the Holy Spirit is, is a, a, a pretty, pretty strong emphasis for me to, because I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Uh, the men that we have Bible study on Wednesday night, Wednesday night, we've been talking about how the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives. We have a chance to testify about His movement in our hearts and lives. And the Holy Spirit does some tremendous work, and I'm just grateful that we get a chance to have a church that, preaches on the Holy Spirit, doesn't leave him out, and has an opportunity. I, lo- I know people like to talk about God, and I know we love to talk about Jesus, but I love talking about the Holy Spirit, and uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I just don't, I just don't want to get away from it, because I just believe that God has anointed that part of our lives, and he wants us to understand the, his, he's as much a part of that as anything else. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Holy Spirit and his movement in our lives. And when I think about tonight, a key line that is really important from the book of Divine Direction is that we'll make our decisions and our decisions make us. Think about that for a moment. For those of us, if you stop to go back into your life, you'll find, have you made some decisions that have had had a huge effect upon your life? (laughs) There's been things that have gone on in our lives, decisions we've made, right or wrong, that have had a tremendous impact. And it's affected us. Some of the decisions we made as teenagers affected us as we got older. 
some of the decisions we made as young adults have affected us. And we watch this effect all over the place when we think of our world and think about some of the decisions our government officials make and some of the decisions that people make that we watch. And we wonder how people can do some of the things they do. I'm, I've always been intrigued to find out why someone can do some of the things that we hear about in the news. I, it, it doesn't even enter my mind some of the decisions that some people have made, parents make, and some of the decisions. But decisions have a huge impact upon our lives. And we're really a result of the decisions that we made in the past. <laughs> I think we talked about it Wednesday night in our Bible study, how sometimes the decisions we make in our past, we look at those things and, you know, and we can all go back and see some things that have gone wrong in our lives. But I also want us to recognize that those things of our past and the decisions we made have an impact on us today and can have a positive impact, even though they were negative then, but today they can have a positive impact upon our lives. The importance of understanding that everything that's going on in our lives, you know, you, you, you always start out the meeting that you're a recovering, what do we call functional alcoholic? You were a functional alcoholic for a number of years. And, and the decisions you made there, but those decisions now have been turned around to where you're now helping others with some of the same areas of that life with them but see the decision you made past you can look at that and say oh yeah I made some bad decisions but God can use those bad decisions when we come around to make them the decisions that we follow him so I think that we have to understand that we don't you know Satan would love to beat us up and Satan would love us to be reminded of the decisions we made and all the bad decisions we made but I also want to say God wants to use those bad decisions to help us be a great influence for the Him today through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Amen? So we see the power of what He can use. He can use those bad days, those situations in our lives. And it's amazing the testimony that can be used. Because there are people like Marty, there are people like you, there are people like me. All of us have something in our lives but those decisions. So what we decide today will determine who we are and what we become. That's very true. We make our decisions. Our decisions make us. The decisions we make today determine the story we'll tell tomorrow, right? So that's, that's an important aspect of understanding. Those stories that sometimes we beat ourselves up over can also be used for the glory of God and the Holy Spirit can take those stories and make them a part of who we are and a testimony to what God can only do through him, through us, through him comes to, our, to us through the Holy Spirit. Amen? So the big challenge of today, the big challenge is that many people today are not great decision makers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Indecisiveness is a growing problem. So many options. Another reason why people struggle with making decisions, according to research that's been done, is that what they call over-programming our kids. Now, let me ask you this. For example, all right, come on now, think back. Not trying to take it too far back. But when you were growing up, some of us in this room, we didn't have cell phones, right? We didn't have cell phones to watch and look at all the time. The way we lived was to do what? That's a, that, was my, that was my button to give, you, give me the answer. Did you hear this thing? Did you hear that? What did we do when we were younger? We didn't have cell phones. What did we do? We read. <laughs> Forget that. Forget that one, too. <laughs> Reading and we're done. We used to go outside and what? Play. We'd go outside and play. Now, today, you can't go outside. We used to be, it used to be a day when I, in Detroit, Michigan, where I was born and raised, sorry, Sorry, Susie, but in Detroit, Michigan, a good state like that, I was born and raised, we could go to the neighbors and walk in their back door and just tell the neighbor, the mom of the house, hey, Keevan's here, just want to let you know. We could just walk right in. No big deal. Can't do that. Now you get shot. But the, the point I'm trying to get at is we didn't have these things. And the way we used to live was to go outside. And now, isn't it, inter isn't it interesting? Have you ever watched some of the public service announcements? What are they trying to get kids to do today? Play outside. <laughs> get away. Why? They need the what? Exercise. So it's kind of interesting that that's the way we were raised, and now the public service announcements is trying to get kids to spend 60 minutes and be active. You think that. Our upbringing, the things that we used to do, 
and get a good education so we can get a good job. A lot of things like that would go on. What do you love to do? We used to tell our kids. What do you love to do? We want you to do what you love to do. And all those kind of things. But sometimes we have to understand that those decisions, we sometimes settle for the less than the best. The illusion of the perfect job or the perfect family or the perfect marriage. We get, and I, what I mean by illusion, by the sense of we all have our issues and struggles. An uncommitted life is also always an unsuccessful life. And so we need to understand the decisions. If we're not going to commit ourselves to Jesus Christ, it will affect our lives. And the decision to accept Jesus Christ affects our lives. And so I'm just kind of going there because I want us to understand that those decisions need to have the work of the Holy Spirit behind it. So I want to take you to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And in Acts chapter 20, it'll be on the screen, I believe. And this is verse number 22, but this is in the New Living Translation. Here's Paul speaking. Or, uh, yeah, here's, here's Acts and some of the things that are going on. And Paul's just kind of giving us the thought. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. How'd you like to know that one? Everywhere you're going to go, you're going to be put in jail. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul is talking about a very emotional decision. But what I'm trying to get to you tonight is I'm thinking about the Holy Spirit and the decisions that we make. As God, something does, Paul was prompted to go somewhere else. For, but I hear these some things, here's some things that I want to bring to your mind about what Paul said to us. The first thing is, and you'll see in verse number 22, and now I am bound by the Spirit. In another version it reads, I think if some of you have another, compel, some may have compel in their, in their Bible, it means to be wrapped up or tied up. One is wrapped up or tied up by the Spirit. So what he's trying to say is, and now I am bound by the Spirit. But what I want you to understand is that we're living in a world where we're pulled every which way. We got a lot of decisions and a lot of things coming our way and the decisions we make. And we need to make sure as followers of Christ, we need to be aware that the Holy Spirit wants to wrap us and wants to come and bind us in his spirit to lead us to where he wants us to go and what he wants us to be and what he wants us to say. It could be something really big. It could be something that seemed very insignificant. But when God compels us through his spirit to do something, it doesn't make any difference on the scale of big to small. It's the purpose behind it. God has a purpose, purpose for our personal lives and purpose for those that come in contact with us. There's a purpose behind what's going on. So when we read that, the Spirit's prompting, and now I am bound by the Spirit. Every time the Spirit prompts you, it's important that you stay and hear what it has to say. Any of you ever been prompted to call somebody in the middle, well, in the middle of the night? No, not no. But have you been wakened, awakened in the middle of the night and asked to pray for somebody? I think we've all had those moments, haven't we? Well, that means the Spirit is prompting us for that purpose. And how many times have you heard testimonies when you've prayed for that person? They'll say, I don't know what happened, but at 3 o'clock in the morning, I just felt his presence, or I felt someone was praying for me. Have any of you ever sent a card when you wondered why you were sending a card to somebody? Well, the promptings. Of, I think we have to understand the promptings of the Holy Spirit don't necessarily, aren't just huge, big, uh, uh, big events in life. It's those simple things, like bringing your pastor a coconut cream pie that could be a prompting of the holy spirit that didn't go over well but uh, but what i'm trying to say is, what i'm trying to say is promptings of those things making a phone call making a phone call to somebody who needs to hear from us you don't know why i i can tell you story after story of the prompting why i'm standing here is a prompting of the spirit it seemed like the spirit said i want you to start a church in forney the prompting of the Spirit doesn't mean it's going to be big and glorious and, and look at what I've done, but it's going to be His prompting because I want to be bound by His Spirit to do whatever it is, whether it's a loud voice or whether it's a still, small voice. I want to follow His Spirit because there's something behind what He's leading me and wanting me to do. That's the power of the Spirit and being prompted by Him. Sometimes it sounds stupid and crazy. He's asking me to do what? 
Think about all the times in the Bible. He wants me to do what? Let me say this to you. Anytime that you feel the prompting of the Spirit and you do it, even though you think it's so small and insignificant, let me tell you, the song for those of us that were raised in the church, little is much when God is in it. If God, through His Spirit, has prompted it, I can promise you there's a purpose behind it and you'll, you may never see. You know, we've talked about this. You may never see the results of what we do. But that's not important. The importance is being prompted by the Spirit to do what he asks us to do because it's for somebody, somewhere, to, be, to have someone that's being sensitive to the Spirit. And then, we have to trust God's process. It says, I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. So it says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Certainty, here's a second point, certainty and uncertainty. Certainty, certain uncertainty is how I wanted to word it. Certain uncertainty. Here's what he has issues. Now, what happens if this were to happen to you? Not knowing what will happen to me. That's, have you ever been pa- para- paralyzed because you're afraid of what might happen to you if you did that prompting? <laughs> if you're like me, no, I shouldn't say that. I probably shouldn't have wrote that down. If you're like me, I want detail. I'm not a detail guy. You know, a lot of some of you guys. Are, now, I've learned my friend Scott, he, he's... He, he, he got, he, man, he wants the details. He doesn't want to finish a chapter of the Bible study unless we go through the whole chapter. We can't leave them halfway out. But see, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes we want details. Nothing wrong with wanting that. But I can tell you this, there's some things in life that are certain to be uncertain. There's things that we don't know what will happen. And we need to realize we want the details. God doesn't give us the details. Could you let me in, God, on, have you ever said this to God? Could you let me in on steps three, four, and five? Just kind of let me in, let me, give me a little hint. But I found that I need to take steps one and two first. But see, I want to plan my own life. But the Lord determines my steps. Certain uncertainty. What should be my plan? So what should be my plan? If I'm being prompted by the Spirit, and certain there's going to be certain uncertainties, what should be the prompting and what should be the movement of my plan what should be my plan one thing be obedient just be obedient spirit's prompting certain uncertainties be obedient but i want certainty (laughs) but here's some certainty for you tonight god will never leave you he will not forsake you he will light your path for your feet God will advise you. God will watch over you. But the human, human part of me says, I need more certainty. <laughs> but listen, if you're not living with a little uncertainty every now and then, you're not living by faith. And I think that's very important. We see Paul living by faith. Now, here's an interesting thing. Now, here we got the story, not knowing what will happen to me. Then we go into the third point of predictable resistance. All I know is I'm being prompted. I don't know what's going to happen there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. How would you like to know that up front? If you tell me that up front, I'm not sure I'm going to go there, okay? I'm not sure I want to go there if that's what's going to happen. But the point of the matter is, Paul was going to be obedient. So, What if you've witnessed at work and they came and locked you up and put you away for four years? No big deal, you might say. We have to understand if you're not ready to face opposition for your obedience to God, you are not ready to be used by God. I have to be honest with you, and some of you have already heard my story. There's been a part of me over the last few months that wanted to give up here. Just not seeing a lot of folks, people. I'm glad we had a good number tonight. But I wanted to give up. I wanted to kind of just kind of chuck it and say, forget it, you know. And I feel like there's been that opposition, not, not so much from people, but just the opposition of timing or whatever the case may be. But here I have to say to you, anything significant we do is going to be met with resistance. Come on, Marty, I'm waiting for an amen. Because we've talked about that. <laughs> we've talked about that. It's going to be met with resistance. It's going to happen. 
I've said it. Along the way, like I said to you earlier, God is maybe, maybe the God's not in this. Resistance, here, listen to this, what I wrote. Resistance is not necessarily a sign that you're out of God's will. Resistance is often a sign that you're doing exactly what God's called you to do. Hmm. Discouragement, resistance. It could be exactly what God wanted you to do. But Satan would love for you to give up. Satan would like for me to give up. Satan would like for us to give up. But sometimes doing that resistance, and I know I wish I'll have to get Marty up here some other time, but talked about how many walls he's hit on the path of trying to start the ministry he's doing. But let me also say to you, the struggle that you're having today is also developing spiritual strength you'll need tomorrow. I think, when I think about the position I'm in as district superintendent, I've always wondered, there's two things in life I didn't want to do, and I've heard, you've heard me say this. One of them was to live in Ohio. Do I hear an amen to my right? Amen. One of them was to not live in Ohio. The other was not to be a DS. But I want you to hear something from me, is to understand that those things, if I've been obedient, I didn't think I was ready to be a DS. I just didn't. I didn't think I had the abilities. Not. But see, the thing about it, God was providing all these things along the path, the good and the bad, the decisions in the good and bad, to prepare me for the wonderful experience of being with the family of this district. So what I look at it is, sometimes we have to understand that God has a better plan, and all those things is, at times, I'm trying to understand what he's trying to do and how he's, but he's developing me. He was developing me along the way. I, I had two times before offers to be a DS. I wasn't ready, but he strengthened me through circumstances and situations. He does the same for you. See, even though there's going to be bad and difficult times, and even though I don't know the details, Paul said this, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that he's given me. Period. If I get focused on seats in the pew, if I get focused on of all the minor so-called metrics that we have set up in our world for success, if I get focused on the metrics of this world, I will always be disappointed. But if I focus on the Spirit, I will never be disappointed. My humanity will stick in there once in a while. Paul did not have a plan for the future, but he had a plan to obey the Spirit. He didn't have a plan mapped out in the five-year uh, thing. I've, I've always had staff that said, we need to get together and do a five-year plan. Not against the planning. I'm just not one of those type guys. Long-term or where we're going. He had sometimes some things that he had hoped for, but how does this apply? Whatever you are doing, serve Jesus there, whatever. Just, just serve him there. Just. My favorite verse, and I've said this to you many times, is John 14, 31. It drove me on May 27th of 1975 when instead of driving my truck to Detroit to work for Ford, I drove my U-Haul. All, all Pam and I had at that time was enough furniture for a, a 6 by 12 U-Haul trailer. We we're going to take the trailer to Detroit and start my job there in Ford Motor. And instead of going to Detroit, I ended up going directly north to Chicago, and that's where it all started. And on that day as I was driving, John 14, 20, 31 came to me. He says, I will do what my Father requires of me so that the world will know I love my Father. Everywhere I've been, that's been my driving force because I just want to do what my Father asked me to do. I didn't always agree with it. I didn't always want it to happen that way. But I can tell you this, God wants to take your plans. And if you listen to him, his plan will always bring about honor and glory to his name. And even though it may bring difficulty to me at times, it has been the most glorious thing to do his plan, to be prompted by his spirit for the certain of the uncertainties for what awaits me. What do you want to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to be? When we get to the right when we get that right, God will lead us to do the, the next thing. When we get that right, he'll ask us to do the next thing. So what I want to pose to you today is, let's be honest, what are we about? What we, most of the time, we think about what is best for 
instead of what is best for him. I just want you to hear that tonight. You don't have to worry so much about the future. We are just called to be obedient. And what is very important for us to see this in our walk and our journey with him is to understand that when the Holy Spirit prompts us, we do it, and we need to do it in obedience, and we need to follow him. My point to you tonight is the Holy Spirit is very active in our lives if we have a determination to be obedient to what he asks. It may, like I said, it may seem crazy. It may seem so out of sorts of, I don't have the abilities to do that. I don't have, the, you know, you had anxiety. I didn't have the ability to stand before people and preach. I, 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 there's a lot of things that I can beat myself up over that I don't have the ability. But I'll tell you what, I have never been disappointed that if I didn't have the ability, all God wanted me to do by his spirit is be available. Just be available. When I'm available, he's amazing the ability he gives you when you're available. If you just take his spirit and let him work in your life, he's powerful that will give you the things. He'll give you the gifts. He'll give you the abilities. He'll give you all the things. I'm glad, you know, I, I didn't like my mom. I, sh I probably shouldn't confess that to you. I didn't like my mom because she made me practice the piano. I had to practice for a half hour, 45 minutes every single day. I didn't like my mom. I didn't go as far as say I hated my mom, but I didn't like my mom, okay? Making me do it. But you know what? I'm glad she did. I get to use that that was raised and the decision that she made. She made the decision for me. I mean, that's all. I didn't have to have the Holy Spirit. I had a fly swatter, okay? I mean, that was it. That was a decision that was made for me. I mean, the fly swatter was ready around the corner, ready to smack my hands if I didn't practice. My point is, I'm glad I did. And what I'm also glad is that the from day one of my walk, the Holy Spirit has been so faithful that even though it struggles and even though I've been resistant sometimes, I found out that every time you do what he asks you to do, he'll never be disappointed. And even if you don't know what the outcome is, be, that's not what you're supposed to be worried about. You need to be doing one thing and one thing only, be obedient. When we're obedient, the Holy Spirit will do this job, his job in our lives. We don't know how long it might be. We don't know what it's going to take. We don't know the power that's going to need to happen or the abilities. But let me also say that God will give you the abilities if you're letting the Spirit in your, in your own heart call you to be available. He'll do it every time, and he knows what he's doing. There are times I don't. I think I do, but I know he knows better. So I just want to encourage you as we're studying through the Holy Spirit. I am going to, in a, in a little while, we've got some things this month we're going to have uh, come up. Like I said, Norita will be preaching uh, next Sunday for us. And then we're going to have Father's Day, which we'll still meet here on Father's Day. And then the next Sunday, I want to encourage you to come back because we're going to watch a global service from the Global Ministry Center that's going around the world for 24 hours about grace. So we're, if I can, if I can, if... If I, can, if I can show Narita how to do it. <laughs> yeah, you all know about Narita. She can do anything. The problem is we're going to try to show it in our service here because it's coming out of Kansas. It's being shown every hour, and we're going to show it here on the screen to watch a global ministry from the Global Ministry Center. We will also meet. We'll talk about the 4th of July, and then we have district assembly. But I'm excited. I'm glad Sunday night has worked out for you to come. I know these ladies come from uh, south of Dallas, and it's a lot easier on Sunday than it is Monday, and they come sometimes on the Friday, and we're just grateful. But just pray that God will continue to lead the Spirit. There's some people we need to reach out to. Let's do it and see what God can do. Amen? If the Spirit prompts you, what's the key word? Be obedient, and you'll see what he can do. Scott, you, you do so well at taking up the offering. If I could get you, and don't come back. Thank you for listening today. Join us every Monday night at 6.30 p.m. at 413 South Bodark Street in Forney, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, email us at kwentworth at netxnaz.net. That's k-w-e-n-t-w-o-r-t-h at n-e-t-x-n-a-z dot net.